Um, today we are talking about orthodoxy, rationalism, and pietism. I'm going to touch kind of briefly at first on orthodoxy and rationalism, and then we're going to talk about some of these others that go on. Mostly we're going to be talking about wars. Uh, the 30-year war, most especially, one of the most devastating wars on the continent of Europe, and then the English Civil War. And so, Larry, uh, Larry, you should be happy with this. We're going to talk about Puritans today. <laughs> we may not always say positive things about Puritans, but we're going to talk about them. I know, yeah, I can tell. Uh, like everybody else, there's good things and bad things to say about them, okay? Well, let me start out with kind of a general introduction about the rise of rationalism and orthodoxy. Because this kind of gives up. This is where everything is going, including the results of the wars that we're going to talk about today. Throughout the conflicts of the 16th century, that is the 1500s, that's when the Protestant Reformation really launched. You remember the year that, that it, it technically started? 1517. 1517. Good for you Lutherans in the crowd. Um, 1517. 1517 was when Luther nailed the 95 Theses on the door of the Wittenberg Cathedral. It had started really before that. We had had uh, Wycliffe and John Huss in the century before that. Uh, Wycliffe in England, Huss in Bohemia, which uh, in, in, in various other things, Zwingli came along around the same time as Luther did, even though Luther gets credit for actually setting fire to things because he was much more visible. Um, but throughout that whole period of the 1500s, the 16th century, for the most part, as, as Oftentimes there were political reasons that crept into it. People did things for political reasons. But always, even in the midst of those political reasons, there was a general sense in which most of these people really did believe they were trying to do God's will. In other words, they still did have religious reasons for it. As secular as, as the popes got, most of them, not all, but most of them still had a desire to do what they thought God wanted the church to do, to be what God wanted the church to be. You get people like Charles V, uh, the Holy Roman Emperor, or Francis I. Um, they, while they fought against each other, they all maintained that they wanted to have a pure church. You get Luther's and you know uh, Frederick of Wise and all these people. And while there may have been for some of the political figures some political ramifications to this stuff, for the most part, they really were working under the auspices or under the the, the idea that this was the right thing to do from a perspective of what God wanted, even though they ended up killing each other over it, okay? Now, the 17th century, that is the 1600s, we begin to see a change in that. Because of all the devastation that happened, um, you began to get more and more people who were beginning to say, you know, maybe that much religious enthusiasm is not the right idea. Maybe it's possible to be too religious for anybody's good, in fact, too religious in terms of trying to maintain your religious beliefs, even if you have to kill somebody else over it, that maybe that's not how God wants to do it. And so more and more people began to think that there was, uh, that religious tolerance was not only a, a more just, but even a more practical and a wiser policy to pursue. It's also during this time that um, we begin to see the rise, and if you, if you know your history, we begin here to get into the uh, Enlightenment, all right? the Enlightenment thinking, sort of pre-Enlightenment, where people are beginning to, um, to lift human rationality to the point where it becomes the highest of all factors. You'll notice rationalism. Let me make sure you understand what I'm saying here. Rationality means using rational human thought. Rationalism, the ism on it, is where you believe that human rationality is the highest of all faculties. That faith or, you know, that nothing else is Trump's human rationality. That's rationalism. It's actually an ideology. Whereas rationality simply means using the brain God gave us in a reasonable way, right? So, in the 17th and 18th century, uh, we began to see increasing doubts uh, of traditional dogmas. This is where um, 17th, 18th, and especially the 19th century is where liberalism came into theology, for instance. Um, the more the Germans got involved, the more liberal they got. Uh, Clint, he's not here for me to say that to him, but maybe he'll watch the video. 
Bob and I have this ongoing thing. He always feels like I pick on the Germans, and I go, well, when it comes to theology, there's reason to pick on the Germans. Um, but more and more, there is this, in, this desire to rely on human reason, and they start talking about a natural, quote unquote, natural religion, which means you're not relying on miraculous stuff, you're relying on what makes sense, what seems natural if, you're, if you see human rationality. Now, Christianity, Orthodox Christianity, let me just sidebar here, you know, theological point. Um, true Christianity is not against rationality. It is not against using your brain. There is no such thing as an inappropriate question. There's some inappropriate answers. But Christianity is not afraid of the truth because all truth is God's truth. So do not misunderstand me and uh, think I'm saying that, that human reason is a bad idea. Human reason is one of the greatest gifts God gave humanity and we need to use it. But we need to use it in the context of some humility. And that's the problem we got into in the pre-enlightenment enlightenment periods is that we lost all humility and thought it was all about us. You know. Okay, so we're moving more and more toward that. However, during the same time when we talk about orthodoxy, theologians that came along after the reformers, the, the Lutheran theologians that came along after Luther, the Zwinglian theologians that came along after Zwingli, the, Cal the reformed theologians that came along after Calvin, <laughs> They started zealously defending the teachings of their great predecessors in the 16th century, people like Luther um, and, and his successor Melanchthon, Calvin and his successor Beza and others. Okay? And they started focusing not on the Word of God and what the Word of God says and how we understand it and apply it. They got oriented more toward defending what their heroes had said. In other words, the Lutheran theologians, unlike Luther, were not concerned about what the Bible said, they were concerned about what Luther said. And in the process of doing that, they created what can only be described as some very rigid and cold and academic theologies, because they were trying to defend what had previously been said, not what was true necessarily. To the point that Luther and Calvin, for instance, did not have serious problems with each other. At least when Luke, uh, Calvin's Institutes came out in its first edition, Luther read it and was very complimentary of it. He said, this guy's on right on track. There are some theological differences, like the presence of, of Christ in the uh, communion elements that Calvin and Luther differed on. And they, there's sort of, Protestants have sort of gone back and forth on that. But for the most part, there was not the sense in the 16th century, the founders of the Protestant Reformation did not have nearly as much problem with each other as their successors did. When you read about Calvinism, or for most of you, if you even hear the word Calvinism, you think about this rigid five-point Calvinism, predestined, how can I be mean about this? That was not John Calvin. John Calvin, as brilliant as he was, and he was a genius, everybody knew that, as committed as he was, he poured out his life, um, he was quite humble about this whole thing. In fact, on the issue of predestination, and you need to know, there were no theologians before Arminius' successors who did not believe in predestination. It was universal. You may misunderstand what predestination means. Later on, even Jacob Arminius, the guy for whom Arminianism, the supposedly anti-Calvin thing that's named for, he considered himself a Calvinist. He actually believed in predestination. He just defined predestination differently. So the point is, the people who came after these folks were so determined to differentiate their, their teacher's teaching, you know, their hero's teaching, from everybody else, that they got mean-spirited about it, and cold, and academic, and, I mean, we went back to the times, they even talk about Protestant scholasticism. In the Catholic Church, scholasticism was the period of time, and it came out of the schools, when they were writing these massive theologies. I mean, you know, we're talking tens of thousands of pages. And they would have long discourses, long discourses on issues like how many angels can dance on the head of a pen. That's a real example. I'm not making that up. Okay. Um, well, we get into the, the Protestant orthodoxy period, which is sometimes called Protestant scholasticism, and it was almost as bad. You had people producing nine volume, twelve volume, twenty volume, and volumes were big fat books of theology. All of it oriented toward defending who, whichever school's predecessor was, if it was Luther or Calvin or whoever it was. So it took a huge change. Don't be mad at Calvin for what the hyper-Calvinists who came a hundred years later said about him. That's not who Calvin was, okay? 
he doesn't really need me to defend him. But. Um, and the result of, you'll notice this conflict. Some people are going toward rationalism and natural religion. Some people are getting more and more and more entrenched in trying to defend their predecessors. The result of that and a lot of other factors, political included, is a series of devastating religious wars. In fact, the Thirty Years' War in, in the 1600s in uh, the continental Europe was the bloodiest and most devastating war prior to the 20th century. The First World War was the first war we had that was as bad as the Thirty Years' War was in the 1600s in, in Europe. Okay, mostly in Germany, but in, in continental Europe. I mean, others like England got involved in it, but they didn't fight the battles there. Okay? Any questions about that? That's sort of a preface to where we're going with this. Okay? Let's talk about the Thirty Years' War. Thirty Years' War, it's not as evenly cut dried as this, but generally it was from 1618 to 1648. Prior to this, in 1555, the Peace of Augsburg was when Charles V, who was the Holy Roman Emperor, and you'll remember there wasn't a nation of Germany back then. There were these various princedoms, and they were loosely connected with each other, uh, but they all belonged to the Holy Roman Empire. After Charlemagne in 800, the idea was that there was an emperor over all of the parts of Europe that didn't have their own king that had any power. France had its own king, Spain had its own king. They, they weren't part of the Holy Roman Empire, but, although the, the Holy Roman Emperor often thought they were, you know, they acted like they were, but everything else was kind of so loose that there was an emperor over. Charles V was the very Catholic emperor over the Holy Roman Empire in the 1500s. He wanted very much to fight Protestantism, but he kept, I think by divine intervention, he kept having other things that kept him from doing that. The Turks would attack Eastern Europe, and he'd have to focus on that. A new pope would come along who tried to take his power away, and he'd have to march into Italy to deal with that. Francis I of uh, France, what, Francis needed a different name, Francis of France sounds just weird, um, would decide that he wanted to rebel. He didn't like the authority that Charles had. Charles was the House of Habsburg. The House of Habsburg were the rulers of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. We've got a Polish woman in the front nodding her head. Okay, she understands this. Um, but the Habsburgs also, because these royal families would intermarry, etc., the Habsburgs also were, were the family that was in control of Spain. So everybody was always concerned that Charles V or his successors were the king of Spain because they all represented the family, the Habsburgs, that ruled most of Europe for several hundred years. Everybody was always trying to kick their legs out from under them. Okay, everybody was always trying to do something to stop the Habsburgs from being more powerful, which is why Francis I fought them, and why the popes didn't like them, and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, because Charles V kept getting interrupted when he tried to stop the Protestant Reformation in Germany, we'd say Germany, it was that loose affiliation, he finally agreed to the Peace of Augsburg in 1555, Augsburg, Germany. And it said, as long as you promise not to spread your Protestant heresy, I'm using Charles as first now here, then you princes and dukes, whatever areas you rule, the electors, they had different titles, in your area of authority you can decide what the religion is for your group of people, okay? And that was a peace, but it was only a temporary peace because there were all sorts of problems with it, particularly, a lot of people had trouble with it, because that gave Protestantism um, an option only if you were Lutheran. Okay, the only option for, in terms of a Protestant uh, religion, was to be Lutheran. No Calvinist or Reformed. Calvinist and Reformed is the same thing. You'll hear me use both words. Um, reformed theology was that based upon what Calvin wrote. So, no Calvinist, no Anabaptist. Oh, no, no Anabaptist. Anabaptist is what everybody was always after. You know, even until very late, the Anabaptists were persecuted by everybody. And, so, so if, you were, if you were Reformed, a Calvinist, or you're Anabaptist, none of this gave you any help. And so, because more and more people were becoming Calvinists in certain areas, then they had no, no, they weren't helped by this. They still had reason to want to fight it. Also, there was a thing called the Ecclesiastical Reservation in the um, Peace of Augsburg that said, any areas that had been previously controlled by a Catholic bishop had to remain Catholic, even if that bishop converted to Protestantism. Yeah. So you see there are problems here. The Calvinists didn't like it, the Anabaptists didn't like anything, 
um, the, there were big areas that wanted to be Protestant and couldn't because of this rule. So, it was at best a temporary truce, even though they hoped it was going to be a peace. So, in 1576, there's a new emperor, Rudolf II. Now, the Protestants in throughout the Holy Roman Empire immediately did not like him. Why? <laughs> Because he had been raised, he was Spanish, he had been raised in Spain by Jesuits. Okay, nobody liked the Anabaptists and nobody but Catholics liked the Jesuits. Um, because, in fact, some of the requirements that Protestants, when they were winning battles, they'd say, okay, we'll have a truce, but you have to get rid of all the Jesuits. Because the Jesuits were sort of like the Pope's strike force. They were the ones that got sent in for evangelism to deal with all kinds of problems. The Jesuits were seen as, by the Protestants as being the Catholic problem. And they thought, we deal with the Jesuits, we won't have a Catholic problem anymore. All right. And please understand, I'm speaking historically. I'm not. These are not value judgments I'm making on things like that. That's simply the perspective people had. Now, Rudolf II had been raised by Jesuits in Spain, and so none of the Protestants trusted him. They thought, we're going in the wrong direction here. But it turned out that he was weak. Even though he kept trying to do something to, to suppress Protestantism, he was completely unsuccessful for 30 years. Well, in 1606, after 30 years of relative peace, because Rudolf was ineffective, um, riots broke out in the town of Donauwerth. Now, Donauwerth was a city that had declared itself for Protestantism, even though it was right on the border of Catholic Bavaria. All right? Now, as a result of that, and, and the, the protest, the riots happened because it was a Protestant city. There was a Catholic monastery in the town. And the Protestants in the town said, you monks can continue to be uh, popish if you want. One of the words they used. You can continue to practice your Catholicism, but only inside the monastery. Well, the monks decided one day that they were going to get up at and they wanted to have a celebration outside the walls. So they had a procession outside the walls, and they were promptly stoned and beaten back into the monastery by the Protestant city. That's what started the riot. Well, this riot eventually calmed down on its own, but it left a bad taste in people's mouth. And because it was inside the border of Catholic Bavaria, the Duke of Bavaria, Maximilian, a year later, he brought a large army to the Protestant city of Donauwerth. He was, of course, very Catholic, the Duke of Catholic Bavaria. It was Catholic because he decided it was Catholic. And he comes to Donauwerth and starts forcing people to convert to Catholicism brings his army and makes them become Catholics. Well, that didn't go over very well with the Protestants anywhere. So in um, 1608, in response to all of this, so this is a year after Maximilian forcibly converts the Protestants of Donauwerth, Protestants respond to that offense by forming an evangelical union, which means Protestants getting together and, and promising to support each other. In response to that, the next year, a Catholic League was formed. And the understanding when they form these sorts of unions and leagues, this is not a club. This is in preparation to do battle if you need to. It was a, They were <coughs> joining together to promise that they would fight for each other. Which, by the very creation of these sorts of organizations, it meant they were prepared to go to war. The problem for the Protestants was the Catholic League was huge. And because only Lutherans were technically allowed, the Evangelical Union was relatively small. So there was no question that if the Catholic, uh, Catholics in the Catholic League and the Protestants in the Protestant uh, Evangelical Union went to war, the Catholics were going to win just because they had many, many times more people. Well, so there's this, they're standing there glaring at each other. Nobody's actually going to war yet. Then, in Bohemia, what we know as Czechoslovakia, okay, of that area. It, tr it had had a strong tradition of Protestantism after John Huss. After John Huss, this is before the Ref Protestant Reformation started, but the, the Hussites, the people who believed that John Huss had been right, as soon as the Reformation started, they aligned themselves with Reformed theology. As a result of that, a lot of the Germans, when they were being persecuted, the German Calvinists especially, and remember, they, even after the Peace of Augsburg, the Calvinists in Germany didn't get a break. They, they were still not allowed. A lot of them went next door to Bohemia, which is fairly close. I'm going to show you a map in a second. And so you ended up with a significantly increased Protestant, particularly Calvinist, population in Bohemia. Now, um, there was a, um, 
a Catholic king, Ferdinand, who'd been appointed by his brother, who was the Holy Roman Emperor, he got appointed as king. It's amazing the way they did these things. Mm. Now, he was Catholic, and they began to pass policies that were pro-Catholic and anti-Protestant. Well, there were a lot of Protestants here now, in Bohemia, and so they uh, approached the king to protest this. And when the king's advisors refused to listen to them, we have an extraordinary event, which is called the defenestration of Prague. Do you know what defenestration means? It means somebody got thrown out a window. That's what defenestration means. That's what the word means. Look it up. Defenestration, to be thrown out a window. The defenestration of Prague was when the advisors to King Ferdinand refused to even listen to the Protestants who were complaining about some of the pro-Catholic policies. They grabbed two of them and threw them out the window of the palace in Prague. Now, they weren't seriously hurt because they landed on a pile of garbage. But still, the offense of this was the thing that sparked the Thirty Years' War, the defenestration of Prague. You now know a new word, that you didn't know that word. Now, this map, oh, where's Jerry going to be? I meant to bring my pointer. I can, I can do it from here. Um, just keep my head in the frame. <laughs> You'll notice this is Bohemia. Next door to it, yeah, Samuel, if you would, it's in my train. I thought I was bringing it out. I thought I was bringing it out, but I didn't. Um, so, Bohemia. That's where the defenestration of Prague just happened. You've got Moravia and Silesia that we'll mention in a minute, which are countries next door. You've got Bavaria. So right here is the area of Bavaria where the whole uh, Donald Worth and forcing the Protestants to become Catholic. And then you've got other areas here. You'll notice over here in the purple, there's two sections called Palinate, and you see the arrow there. There was a, a region, the Palinate, Frederick was the elector of Palatine, of the Palatine, and ruled it there. He was a Protestant. Now, keep that image in mind. This also gives you some idea how many different, you know, dukedoms, fiefdoms, and this is this is better than it had been, you know, a while before that. This is actually in the 1500s. This is not exactly at the time, but you, uh, this is the best example I could get to show you where Bohemia was, Bavaria, which is, <coughs> and then the Palatine, which is over to the left of that, which is a Protestant area. Okay. Does that make sense? And you can tell where this is, right? Up above and top is Denmark, you know, uh, Hungary, um, etc. All right? Now, let's keep going with the Thirty Years' War. This is after the defenestration of Prague. King Ferdinand does not respond well to that. King of Bohemia. His advisors being thrown out windows is not something he can approve of. And so, the Bohemian Protestants know that, you know, this has reached ahead. They invite Frederick, who is the elector of Palatine. Now you notice that's over. There's there's land, including um, the Catholic Bavaria, is in between them and the Palatine. They're not next to each other. But still, they looked at him and said, he's a Protestant, he's our kind of guy, we want him to be our king. So they invite Frederick to become the king of Bohemia. At the same time that this is going on, the the Protestant rebellion against the King of Bohemia has spread to the east into Silesia and Moravia. So there's more in, in rebellion and upheaval. Okay? Now, by this time, about this time, King Ferdinand of Bohemia, his brother, who had been the uh, emperor, dies, and he becomes the new emperor. All right? He'd been King of Bohemia, now he's the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, which that means this is all part of his stuff. He's affected by Silesia and Moravia and the Palatinate and everything else. So he, in response to this uh, rebellion, he calls on Maximilian of Bavaria, the guy that had done such a you know, nasty but effective job in Donauworth. He calls on Maximilian of Bavaria and his Catholic League to invade Bohemia, to put down this rebellion, because the Bohemians are rebelling. So Maximilian, Catholic Maximilian, invades with his Catholic League army into the Protestant, predominantly Protestant Bohemia, and he crushes the Protestant rebels. All right? Maximilian was one of the really good generals back then, uh, along with some others we'll mention. He crushes the rebels, and he deposes Frederick. And not only does he, do, this is Frederick the Elector of Palatine, not only does he depose Frederick from his new throne, his new kingship, kingdom, in Bohemia, but he also, with the authority of Ferdinand, the new Holy Roman Emperor, 
throws him off his throne in the Palatine, which was an area he had an hereditary right to. Not because somebody invited him to. He had an hereditary right. But they depose him from all of that, and they began to persecute Protestants. In fact, a decree was issued that said that everyone in Bohemia had to either be a Catholic, convert to Catholicism, or leave the country by Easter of 1626. You could not be anything but a Catholic and stay in Bohemia. Now, as a result of that kind of thing, as well as the Thirty Years' War, over the next 30 years, the population of Bohemia declines by 80%. Four in five people are not there anymore. Either they had to go somewhere else, or they were killed. All right? Not necessarily killed by persecution, some of it's death by war. Because the Thirty Years' War was a bloody and gruesome thing. All right. Then, in 1625, England, Denmark, and the Netherlands decide they're going to join the Protestant League, which previously, um, that the, um, I'm sorry, the Evangelical Union, I used the wrong words, the Evangelical Union, and they propose to invade Germany and restore the Palatinate to Frederick. Remember, that when Frederick got defeated in Bohemia, they not only took him off the throne of Bohemia, they took his, his rightful uh, area, which is the, uh, the Palatinate. Um, interestingly enough, Frederick happened to be the son-in-law of James I of England. And so that's one of the reasons England was interested in doing something about this. And we're going to talk about England, the Civil Wars and stuff in a few minutes. James I, he apparently had several children because his daughter married James, although he was an avowed homosexual. They, it's a very strange world back then. Um, you know, they made sure they had heirs. That was one thing. Um, then... Ferdinand, in response to the threat by England, Denmark, and the Netherlands, recruits a second army because he expects to be invaded. He still got the army of the Catholic League under Maximilian. He creates another army and puts it under Albert of Wallenstein, who <coughs> is also a really terrific general. The Catholics had a really good general at this time. Wallenstein and um, uh, Maximilian, two armies, are there when Christian IV of Denmark invades Germany. Denmark was one of the countries that decided to join in this Protestant you know, league. So they invade Germany, and, and he ends up having to fight two armies, which is not easy. So after a little bit of that, they sue for peace. And they end up coming to a truce, and when they sign the truce, the Danish army leaves Germany, and the persecution, almost as though in revenge, increases several fold. Thousands uh, are forced to convert to Catholicism. Then, do we have any Swedes in the group? I've asked that before. Okay. <laughs> Should be your hero. In 1611, a 17-year-old young man named Gustavus Adolphus became the king of Sweden. Now, it wasn't that grand an honor to become the king of Sweden because he had almost no power. Denmark controlled much of Sweden. And the part that Denmark didn't control was controlled by some very wealthy families. And so here's a 17-year-old king. What's he going to do when most of his country is controlled by a foreign power and the rest of it is run by rich, rich families that are not likely to give him anything? But he fooled them. It ended up that Gustavus Adolphus was an excellent ruler. He reunited his people, partly because of his pure honesty and simplicity. He reunited his, his divided people. They refused to take orders from these rich families anymore because they acknowledged that he was their rightful king. And he succeeded in expelling the Danes out of the country. <coughs> Sorry, Carolyn. <coughs> Carolyn's Danish. He's uh, half. Um, but half English. So. So. Swedish. And Swedish, yeah. Uh, now, a staunch Lutheran, Adolphus was, he felt as though what was going on in continental Europe was an atrocity. And it was. And so he decided that he needed to intervene in Bohemia and in Europe. Um, I mean, in Germany. I should say Germany, not Europe. The, the Palatinate, the other things were happening in Germany. Um, both because he felt the Protestants there, since he was a Lutheran, needed their, his defense, and in order to limit the Habsburgs. Because all of these guys, Ferdinand, the new emperor, was a Habsburg. The guy who's sitting on the throne of Spain was a Habsburg. Everybody wanted to, as I said, kick their pins off from under because they kept getting more and more and more power. They'd marry into some other family and they'd rule some other country. So these were both reasons that he felt he needed to do something about this. Now, in 1630, Adolphus invades Germany and he fought a lot of battles and won them all. 
he was apparently an amazing general, even though he was still a very young man, even at this point. He defeats the army of the Catholic League, uh, and even though the people in Germany think, okay, he's a foreigner, he's a Swede, of all things. Uh, I had a friend of mine who's Norwegian, and he, he was single, and he said his, his Norwegian grandmother said, you know, I really want you to be happy, and I think I think you should find a young woman and fall in love and you should marry her. And anybody you love, I would I would accept as long as she's not Swedish. <laughs> True story. He ended up marrying a woman from uh, from Uganda, <laughs> so who definitely was not Swedish. <laughs> uh, so, um, we were crying to watch this. So. The, the Germans were not willing to support Adolphus because they thought he was a foreign invader. And they thought, he's going to come in here and take our land, and he's just going to rule us like everybody else. But he's, they're much surprised that his soldiers are ordered to show respect for the local people. They, they buy the food they need. They don't steal it like most armies. They completely respect him. And he promises over and over again he has no intention of controlling the areas he's defeating. For one thing, they're shocked that he doesn't force Catholics to become Protestants. He doesn't require anybody to change their religious sense once he conquers them. And um, there was a case, for instance, where the French at one point gave him money to support his efforts. He would only receive it with the clear and published understanding that no place that he went would come under the authority of the French. You're not buying you know, a right to control property here. He was a man of great integrity, and everybody really liked him, and they started respecting him. Eventually, the German Protestants started supporting him, and he started getting German princes who were on his side. He even got some Catholics who decided to support him because he was so honorable. That's why I say he's a good hero for the Swedes. Um, then, as Adolphus continued to win, he, he established his terms for peace. He said, this is what will be required for us to have peace. One, everybody, religious tolerance for everyone. People get to worship the way they want. This is amazing especially from somebody who's winning. Second, restore Bohemia to its ancient rights and freedoms. Third, return the Palatinate to Frederick, which he has a hereditary right to. And fourth, expel the Jesuits from the whole empire. <laughs> Again, people looked at this and thought that the problem isn't necessarily with the Catholics, it's with the Jesuits, because they were the, the militant arm. They, were the, they saw themselves as the army of Christ. And they were at the command of the Pope. I mean, they were his elite strike force. It's not an unfair way to say that. And so, frequently, the, the complaints were not against the Catholic Church, it was against the Jesuits. And that was the case with Adolphus. Now, Ferdinand II, again, the Holy Roman Emperor, he recalls Wallenstein. He actually was afraid of Wallenstein because he was such a great general. And so he had disbanded Wallenstein earlier, and he only had one army under Maximilian of Bavaria. He recalls Wallenstein. And Wallenstein proceeds immediately to attack the Swedish army. In the Battle of Lützen, although Wallenstein's army is crushed, the Swedes win a decisive victory. Unfortunately, Adolphus is killed. Because back then, the generals and the kings fought in the front line. All right? None of this standing back with binoculars saying, oh, what are they doing over there? They were up front. Adolphus is killed in this battle. And after that, without his leadership, the war sort of disintegrates into skirmishes and some negotiations and some banditry, and it just gets really messy. But there are no, there are no major battles for a while. Well, Wallenstein, as it turns out, uh, wasn't killed, even though his army got crushed. He takes it upon himself to start negotiating for peace with the Protestants <coughs> without permission from the emperor. Well, the emperor gets word of this, and whether the emperor actually ordered it or not, Wallenstein and several of his top generals get murdered because they thought he was taking authority and maybe trying to gain authority that he didn't have a right to. At that point, the Spanish Habsburgs, remember, the same family that's the Holy Roman Empire, they're sitting on the throne of Spain, which is one of the great powers. The Spanish Habsburgs sent an army to support their German cousins. That set France off. And the French decide they need to do something, so they send support to the Protestants. Even though the... In, in, for all intents and purposes, the ruler of France at this time is Cardinal Richelieu. You've watched the Three Musketeer movies. Yes. That Cardinal Richelieu. Let's uh, talk about him in a minute. He was running the country, very Catholic, although, but he was politically oriented more than, more than theologically oriented. And he sent support to the Protestants, 
um, in order to try to undermine the efforts by the Habsburgs, both the Roman Emperor, the Holy Roman Emperor Habsburg, and the Spanish Habsburgs. Okay, you follow me so far? Yes, sir. Follow me into war. That's what I like to hear. Okay. Well, in 1637, Ferdinand II dies, and his son Ferdinand III becomes the emperor, and he is more tolerant, especially because everybody's tired of this. Everybody is tired of this war. It's been going on at this point. It had been going on for 19 years. Constant war in the areas that we know as Germany and, and, and Czechoslovakia, etc. Then in 1648, they end the Thirty Years' War with the Peace of, West, Peace of Westphalia. Now, the decision at the Peace of Westphalia was that all Catholics, Lutherans, and Calvinists, the Reformers, uh, the, the Reformed, could follow their own faith, their own religion. They could worship freely. You notice not the Anabaptists. Everybody still hated the Anabaptists, mostly because they thought the Anabaptists, because they would not swear oaths, they would not serve, you know, they wouldn't do government service, they wouldn't fight in wars, they were pacifists. The issue they had with them wasn't theological so much as it was uh, secular. They thought that they were, their dissidence was a civil danger, and so that's why everybody was against them. Now, um, the other things that were agreed to besides tolerance was that all buildings and institutions reverted to whichever religious group had held them in 1624, since people had been taking over property and buildings and churches and all that, and that there was amnesty for anyone who had rebelled against their ruler because of the war. You know, the, the Maximilian couldn't go back and take it out against the citizens of, of Donauwerth, even though it was in his territory, because they were Protestants and had rebelled against them. Okay? Now, it's important to note Oh, there it is. Uh, it's important to note that the Peace of Westphalia, which sounds like a move toward Christian generosity and compassion and tolerance and all that, it did not happen because of Christian love and generosity. It happened for two reasons. One, because everybody was was tired of war, and there, you know, it had been thirty years, more than thirty years, since Germany had not had blood being spilled constantly across its land. But also, there was a growing indifference to the importance of religion. The thing I said, talked about earlier. Whereas, uh, when it started, everybody was religious motivation, trying to do the right religious thing, even though they disagreed on what that was, was a primary motivation. By 30 years of bloodshed in the 30 Years War, people were not motivated by that anymore. If anything, they said, let's stop talking about religion. And so there was a growth in indifference to religion because of the 30 Years War, which again contributed to the rationalism and the sort of anti-religious parts of the Enlightenment. Now, um, in fact, many people felt that any doctrine, any doctrine, Catholic, Protestant, Lutheran, Reformed, anything, that led to the atroc kind of atrocities that the Thirty Years' War uh, had created could not be true or right. And as I said, the Thirty Years' War was by far the bloodiest conflict that the world had felt prior to the 20th century in the, in the First World War. Okay. Um, it's also true that this whole thing was the beginning of the concept of a modern secular state. Let's not involve our religious beliefs when we're trying to figure out how our government needs to be set up or run. Let's, let's not confuse those two. That, the end of the Thirty Years' War was when that you know, really started taking hold. Now, the Anabaptists had been advocating that for quite a while, as many of them as were left. But it didn't catch on until the, the sheer horror of the Thirty Years' War forced everybody to rethink. Okay? That is... Thirty Years War, the Continental Conflicts. I'm going to talk about uh, a particular part of it. You notice I didn't mention France a lot. This is mostly Germany, Czechos, you know, Bohemia, uh, East kind of thing. Let's talk about what was called the Church of the Desert in France. You will remember from a previous lecture, Henry the Fourth was the French king. Remember, there had been three Henrys, and all boiled out. Uh, you know, one of them was murdered. Uh, one of them. One of them was, was murdered for being a usurper. One of them was killed by a fanatic. That left Henry IV. He was a French king, and he was so thoroughly modern in many ways that he was willing to change his religion five times, depending upon the circumstances. Once he did it during, during the, the uh, massacre of St. Bartholomew's Day to save his life, at various other times he did it in order for political expediency because, you know, when he marched into Paris and he knew that the, the and he claimed the throne, he knew that Catholic Paris wasn't going to receive him, so he changed from Protestant to Catholic again. Five times he did that. Very modern of him to use political or personal reasons 
more, rather than theological reasons for establishing his religious beliefs. When I say modern, you know, I have quotes around that. I'm not saying that's a good thing. I'm saying it's fairly typical of more modern ways of thinking. Prior to that, as I say, the rulers would have been so adamant about it, many, many of them prior to Henry would have died before they changed their religious views. That was more important to them than their political or personal issues. But that was not true of Henry IV. And because he flip-flopped so much, even though it landed on Catholic, everybody still thought he was Protestant. Because he was nice to the Protestant, he had issued what was called the Edict of Nance. Um, and that edict had given religious freedom, tolerance in France. And so a lot of people, a lot of Catholics thought, I think he's still secretly a Protestant, even though the last time he changed, it was back to Catholicism. Well, what happened was, on May 14, 1610, a Catholic fanatic called Francois Ravillac um, assassinated him for uh, because being a fanatical Catholic, he thought that Henry was actually down to be still a Protestant, and so he assassinated him. That created, he's a Catholic king, you wouldn't think, but that created huge concerns amongst the French Protestants. Why? Because even though technically he was a Catholic at the time he was killed, Henry IV had been the one, the first king, that had really given them freedom of religion. They had really had tolerance under him, and they're afraid, this guy's gone now, who comes next? Are we going to be back to the old days where we're persecuted again? Now, with the new king, Henry VIII, being only eight years old, the, the, his mother is Marie de Medici. She becomes regent. Recognize the name? Marie de Medici? Italian of the Medici family. Uh, when she comes in, one of the first things she does as regent is she affirms the Edict of Nantes. Why? Because she looked around and she saw there were a whole lot of Protestants here who were looking really antsy, and the last thing we want is another war over this. So she confirmed, reconfirmed the Edict of Nantes. But there's a problem, and that is being herself Catholic and from Italy, she had all Italian advisors. Here she is in France, but she's got Italian advisors who can eat that rich food and all the sauces and stuff. Okay, very different. That was a joke. <laughs> so she has her own advisors from Italy, probably her own chefs, who also were Catholic and who did not understand France. They didn't have a clue about the way the French thought. They favored the Spanish Habsburgs. Her court liked the very Catholic, when you say Spanish in this time, you mean Catholic. They're the very Catholic Spanish Habsburgs. So her court, and therefore Marie de Medici, favored the Habsburgs, and they married off Louis the uh, XIII, the even though he was only eight years old, they married him off to Princess Anne of Austria, who despite her name was actually Spanish. She'd been sent to Austria for training, etc. So, the Protestants are looking at this and saying, okay, you just confirmed the Edict of Nantes, but then you marry your son off to this princess who is from the Spanish Habsburg family, Catholic. You're Catholic, you've got all Catholic advisors, and then the king, Charles' sister, Isabella, is married to, the, to another prince in Spain, in fact, the man who eventually would become King Philip IV of Spain. Scaring the Protestants. Protestants are feeling uneasy about all of this. Then in 1622, as Marie de Medici is losing her power, you know, she's getting older, she sees, you know, the, the king is getting older, he's beginning to take more authority, and she's sort of waning. Um, cardinal Armand de Richelieu begins his ascension. As a cardinal, he had become the chief advisor to the young king, who really liked him and looked to him. He was a wily politician, and he was a man who very much was oriented more toward political power than he was theological issues. He was a practical politician, and a very smart one. And so for, um, for years after this, it was actually Cardinal Richelieu who was running France, controlling everything, even though the king is getting older right now. Richelieu, being very politically oriented, could support the German Protestants against the Catholic Emperor because he wanted to undermine the Habsburg Emperor. But at the same time that he was doing that over there, that did not prevent him from oppressing the Protestants in his own country. The, the Huguenots, you remember? The Huguenots, most, most people say it's Huguenots. Um, the Huguenots in France, Richelieu launches a persecution against them, not for religious reasons. That didn't worry him. The reason he was concerned is because Henry IV, Henry IV, the previous king, in order to try to make peace with the Protestants, Catholics, and everything, he had given the Huguenots, the Protestants, 
several fortified cities, the most powerful of which was called La Rochelle. And those fortified cities were Henry's way of saying, see, now we couldn't do anything to you if we wanted to, because you have uh, the authority that comes with having fortifications. Well, that's the part that bothered Richelieu. It wasn't the fact that they were Protestants. It was the fact that they had these multiple cities that could become a political threat if they chose to use it against him or against King Charles. All right? Make sense? He didn't care about the religion. He didn't like the fact that they had fortifications. So, they start assaulting these cities. Richelieu, or La Rochelle, rather, eventually fell. They had started out with 25,000 people in La Rochelle. It was a powerful fortress. By the time it was, uh, because of a siege, by the time it was finally defeated, there were 1,500 people left alive, only barely. You know, when they finally gave up. They were starving, you know, the whole thing. Well, they proceeded with this after destroying La Rochelle. Other of the Protestant cities rebelled. Other Protestants started coming in and wanting to help them. But at that point, once La Rochelle was gone, uh, Richelieu launched an extreme repression and continued it until the last of the Huguenot fortresses was destro destroyed in 1629. And after that, Richelieu left them alone. Once the fortresses were gone, once they no longer uh, offered any kind of political threat, Richelieu didn't care whether they were Protestants or not. In 1642, Richelieu dies. So he had been really pretty much in power for 20 years plus. Um, and the king died a year later. So we end up with a new king, which is Louis XIV. But he's only five years old. Okay. Kings France died early and they left very small, very young successors. So Louis XIV is only five years old. His mother, again, is Anne of Austria, who had been Spanish, even though it's from Austria. And you remember, the Austro-Hungarian Empire was Habsburg, the Spanish were Habsburg. That's why you get a Spanish princess who's living in Austria, grew up there, and therefore is called Anne of Austria, even though she was Spanish, because that's the same family that's running both of those halves of Europe, right? Um, his mother, Anne of Austria, became regent. She was assisted by Cardinal Ju uh, Jules uh, Mazarin, who was a disciple of Richelieu, and maintained the same kind of policies as Richelieu. Well, Henry, or I'm sorry, Louis XIV, who became known as the Sun King. This is, this is all of those movies you see about the glorious courts of the French king and all that. This is, we're talking here, the 14th, Louis XIV through the 16th is what we're talking about. The 14th, he was called the Sun King, and he thought that about himself, and he didn't want anybody else to create any shade around him. So when uh, Cardinal Mazarin died, Louis did not replace him, because he didn't want a cardinal who also would be powerful. So. That began as a time of real conflict. Without a cardinal who had influence on the French king, the Pope started making loud noises. Well, when the Pope started making loud noises, uh, and he felt like, okay, with, with Richelieu, the cardinal, even though Richelieu did his own thing and Mazarin did his own thing, still they had some loyalty to the Pope. The Pope felt like he had his finger on the pulse of the king. Now, he had no contact. The Pope started having problems with that. And Louis responded by saying, I'm the king. You're just a pope, so be quiet. And there started a conflict there, and during that conflict, Louis claimed, you might remember from the first church history class, there was a period of time in which the French were given special treatment by the pope. It's not during the, during the time when the popes were living in France, but even prior to that. It's sort of what led up to, to that. And they had declared there were the liberties of the Gallican church. Gallican from Gaul, which just means France, um, the, Gal the liberties of the Gallican Church basically, basically meant that the church in France, which was run by the king, had a right to name their own bishops, to name their own ministers, to control their own lands, and they could decide if and how much money they sent from the properties to the, to the Pope. And that had been a right of the French church, a unique right for a long time. Well, Louis XIV starts claiming that again. And in the process of that, he gets really adamant, starts stomping his little French feet about not wanting anybody to tell him what to do or to dissent from his authority at all, which leads him to start trying to stamp out all the dissidents, which means the Huguenots, along with others. That process of trying to, to stamp out the Protestant faith, the Huguenots, was called the process of reunion, of all things. It's a little spin for you. And the reason was that the Protestants were pressured to confess, I reunite 
which means they reunited with the Catholic Church. They renounced their Protestantism. Now, at first, um, Louis' efforts started out kind of social pressure, you know, and political pressure, but nothing too aggressive. Then he tried a different tact, but that didn't work, and he started trying to buy conversions. His, his logic in this was that if a priest or a, um, a bishop has become Protestant, that means they lost their livelihood. Bishops were really wealthy, and, you know, Protestant ministers got nothing. And so, still, and so they, they said, um, you know, money may be a factor. And so Louis said, I will pay you to come back to be a, an Episcopal priest or bishop, or a, a, an Episcopal, a, a bishop or a minister to come back into the church. That didn't work. So then he started very aggressively using the army to force whole villages to convert. Now, in 1685... The king issues the Edict of Fontainebleau, which abolishes the previous Edict of Nantes, which gave religious tolerance, and that made it illegal to be a Protestant mm. in France. Now, you'll notice I said that he's using his army to force conversions. Almost nobody during this time, no matter how bad the persecutions got, almost nobody voluntarily said, I reunite. In fact, it's one of the astonishing things. No matter how much they were threatened, no matter how much they were persecuted, you know, there were, like, Villages would be surrounded and say, we're going to burn it all down with you in it unless the village becomes, you know, becomes Catholic again. And the mayor or somebody in authority might say, okay, we'll become Catholic. But individual people, almost to a person, refused to do this. And so the conversions, while they may be forced, and there was physical violence involved in some cases, there was very little affecting of the heart, even though if they were making people say things with their mouth. Now, the Edict of Fontainebleau created a mass exodus of Protestants out of France. It was illegal now to be a Protestant in France. I think there are mosquitoes in this room. Um, and so they left to go to Switzerland, to Germany, to England, to the Netherlands, even to North America. And what happened was, along with that massive exodus, a lot of these people were merchants, they were artisans, they were bankers, they were, they were the money and the skills. In fact, the, um, the departure of all of these Protestants from France created such a massive economic loss that many historians believe that that led to the instability that created the French, Refor the, uh, the French Revolution. Because they were really impoverished once all these Protestants left and took everything they had with them. Okay? So this was not working out so good for the French government. Officially, while there were no Protestants in France, technically, in fact, there were many who remained privately and did not, were not open about it. In fact, they started meeting in the woods at night, in open fields at night, um, and they began to call themselves the Church of the Desert. That's where my heading flew from. They were the Huguenots who decided, this is my country, I'm not going to leave, and I will practice my faith in private, secret, rather than leave. Now, what would happen is, they actually were very successful in keeping it private, but every once in a while the king would, king's troops would get words of some Huguenot gathering and they would surround them all and capture them all. If they were captured, the pastors were executed. And you guys thought this job was easy. Pastors were executed. The men were sent to lifetime service in the galleys. And lifetime in the galleys, meaning rowing you know, ships, probably only meant a couple of years. You didn't live long. Women were imprisoned for life. Children were taken and given to Catholic families to raise as Catholics. So this was not, they weren't kidding about this. Because of all this persecution then, as often happened in the history of the church, a more radical prophetic form of Protestantism arose. And it was emboldened especially by the belief that came that the Lord was preparing to return immediately. Some of the, the more radical French Protestants began to think that this persecution is a sign of the fact that the Lord is coming back right away. Okay? Um, and as I say, for all of that persecution, very few Huguenots recanted and said, I reunite. It's astonishing how few for all of that. Eventually, the more prophetic Protestant movement, the more prophetic Huguenots, turned to armed rebellion. They became not the church of the desert, but the army of the desert, as they call themselves. They were also called Camisards, for a reason that nobody today really knows. We don't know why that became the common name, just like we don't know where Huguenots came from. 
Okay, those French have a different word for everything. Steve <laughs> <laughs> um, Steve Martin says. Um, so the Camisards or the Army of the Desert never numbered at any time more than a few hundred. And these are these are uh, farmers, and they would they would plow and plant and harvest, and then go fight a battle and come back and take care of the farm and then go fight a battle. And the military, a few hundred of these people maintained a military campaign that kept 25,000 of the king's army busy. <coughs> they never knew where they were going to be or what they were going to do, and it was like guerrilla warfare, this army of the desert. The only thing that the king could think of to do about this, or the king's army could think about doing it, is try to just destroy all the areas where they knew these people lived, even though they couldn't identify the specific people. So they started destroying villages, burning villages. Over 500 villages and hamlets were burned to the ground in order to prevent anybody from, you know, from supporting them. I mean, they had to have food, they had to have, you know, someplace to, to sleep, and so they started burning villages. Um, as a result of that, they actually ended up with more volunteers. These people are now homeless, so they went and joined the army. Okay? And they had a more problem, but after a period of time of this burning villages and everything, by 1709, the military government had, or the government of the military, military of the government, had succeeded in either capturing or killing almost all the leaders of this, this rebellion. Okay? It was not until 18 or 1787 and Louis the Sixteenth, so we're three generations later now, that religious tolerance finally was decreed in France. And by that time, the people were so tired of everything, they were so tired of what had happened in the intolerance. Again, the same thing you saw in Germany. They were fed up with this. Stop already. We don't really care. Whether you're Catholic or Lutheran or Reformed, as long as you're not an Anabaptist, <laughs> we don't care, just stop. And so in, in 1787, Louis the 16th did declare religious tolerance, which was maintained. Okay, we're going to take a break, and we're going to come, when we come back, we're going to talk about the Puritan Revolution in England. <clears throat> Puritan Revolution, we're going back to England. As long as Queen Elizabeth was alive, she managed to walk the very difficult line that none of her predecessors, you will remember that she had had a half-brother and a half-sister before her who tried to make the country Protestant and then Catholic, and both of them were disasters. Elizabeth came in and she returned from the Catholicism of her sister, uh, Mary Tudor. She returned England to a Protestant format, uh, which her father, Henry VIII, had wanted. But she did so in such a way that she was able to maintain the balance. And she did it primarily by having a moderate Calvinist theology, Protestant theology, but with very high church worship and governance. The church had bishops like the Catholic Church did, and priests like the Catholic Church did, although they could marry. It had um, altars and vestments and stations of the cross and the whole thing. If you go to an Anglican or Episcopal church today, you'll see the same thing unless you go to one of those wacky ones, but most of them are just like that. Um, I mean, there's some that are just very different. Uh, but that, that's Mary, or Elizabeth rather, was able to walk that line of balance so that the people who wanted the very high church of Catholicism felt comfortable with the worship. The people who wanted the theology of Calvinism were okay with it too. It was an astonishing thing. Well, Elizabeth was a queen for a long, long time, and she maintained that throughout her life. But she died in 1603, and she did not have a direct heir. Before her death, however, she appointed or announced that her heir, which would be the next in succession, which she gave her approval, was James the, the Sixth of Scotland, who was the son of Mary Stuart. You will remember that Mary Stuart was the one that Elizabeth had to have killed, not because she wanted to, but because Mary Stuart, Catholic Queen of Scotland, had done everything she could to try to undermine and even was involved in assassination plots against Elizabeth. After many, many different opportunities, Elizabeth finally had her executed. Although, all history acknowledges she didn't want to do that. Well, a sign of her sensibility and balance and fairness is, before her death, Elizabeth said that Mary Stuart's son, James VI of Scotland, would be her heir. And so he became James I of England. This is the same, you know, James that I was talking about a minute ago that had kids, even though, you know, he was not inclined toward women, okay? Um, the English never liked James I, and they never liked the fact that he had strong plans to try to reunite Scotland, and or to unite Scotland and England with consistency as one kingdom. The Scots, even though they were under control for much of this time of England, they never liked it. You know, they didn't want to be. They had their own 
you know, Presbyterianism had pretty much settled in in, uh, in Scotland. Um, it had been Catholic, but then, you know, we talked about that in the previous discussion about Scotland. Um, and they had a different, a different way to do church and everything else. Well, James comes in. He's James I of England and James VI of Scotland. He wants to bring them all together as one thing, one government, one people, one religion. Now, the English Calvinists especially uh, were very concerned about James's plan to unite the kingdoms. They thought that... Um, they didn't want to unite the kingdoms, but they thought we do want to change England to be a, to look a little more like Scotland, because in Scotland the Protestant Reformation had gone further than it had in England. So the English Calvinists are thinking, okay, we now have a Scottish king as our king. This is the time when maybe we can push this forward to create a church in England that looks more like the Reformed Church of Scotland. Make sense? And they were very frustrated they weren't able to move forward on that more quickly. The ones that were more radical about this change, who wanted the church in England to become more Calvinist, were called the Puritans, because part of their belief was that they wanted to purify the church. Make sure you're awake for this, Larry. Uh, they want to purify the church. He's been telling me, what are you going to talk about the Puritans? Uh, they, wanted to purita uh, they wanted to purify the church, so they were called the Puritans. And they thought that meant getting rid of vestments and altars, getting rid of incense, and, you know, uh, lots of things. We'll talk about that a little bit. But even within the Puritans, there were two kinds of Puritans. They split fairly evenly between the Presbyterian Puritans, which means they wanted to have a church, that a national church, but that the local body was had presbyteries or boards of elders that would run the local church, but they would all be connected in the national church. And then there were Puritans who were independents, meaning they thought every church should be independent on its own. You don't even need a national church, because then somebody's trying to tell you what to do. Okay. Now, to give you an idea, a model of some of the things that were happening in here, um, an independent leader along that time named John Smith, spell like, spell like Smythe, but pronounced Smith, John Smith uh, had been a Church of England minister. He decided that it needed to go further, and so he started his own independent congregation, all right, which was illegal. You still couldn't have an independent congregation. There was the Church of England. Catholics were given some permission, but you weren't allowed to do an offshoot version of the Church of England. There were still controls. Well, since this was an illegal church and they felt threatened, they eventually ended up fleeing to Amsterdam and setting up the church there. Smith got more and more radical, more and more crazy, to, to, be, to tell you the truth. For instance, he decided that, um, first, that no translation of the Bible was valid. It had to be read in Hebrew and Greek. But because, and so he would stand up in church services and read out of Hebrew the Hebrew and Greek Bibles. But then, because nobody could understand Hebrew or Greek, he would translate it into English for them. And I'm thinking, isn't that a translation? <laughs> but, and he decided that infant baptism was not good, and, and so he, <clears throat> in front of everybody one day, he took a bucket of water and a ladle and he baptized himself, you know, and he became known as the self-baptizer. And then he baptized everybody else again. All right, so he was an Anabaptist in that regard. Anyway, he was getting crazier and crazier. The man that had funded his trip, the moving of the church to Amsterdam was a man named Thomas Helwes, who supported the idea of an independent church, but he did not, you know, he, he uh, Smith lost him at a certain point. So Helwes took part of the congregation that didn't like where Smith was going, took them back to England, and founded the first Baptist church in England. Hmm. Baptist church or Calvinists, but with some particular, you know, things about them, uh, partly because they're independent, right? Um, they have a different sense of church governance, although I know more and more about the churches that are going back to a Presbyterian form of governance, which means you have a, you have a board of elders. Um, eventually, those Baptists split between the Baptists who held to a stricter Calvinist predestination, they were called the particular Baptists, that, that you know, God is particular about who's going to get saved sort of thing. You know, it's not everybody, it's only particular people that are predestined. Versus the general Baptists, which followed Arminianism. We'll talk about in a minute, or a few minutes. Um, the general Baptists, and you still have a general Baptist convention in the United States. That meant everybody gets saved. Everybody who professes faith gets saved. It's not universal. But um, 
So you ended up splitting things up there. The point is that without Elizabeth's moderation, the Calvinists feared that the high church look of worship in the Church of England was going to return them to what they called Romanism. That is, popishness. That is the Catholic Church. <coughs> now, James I was the son of Mary Stuart, and he was a Catholic. Now, the, the, church, the Protestant Church had become quite strong. It had become uh, the dominant church in Scotland, but he was still a Catholic. And he believed in religious tolerance for the most part, except he, he wanted an absolute monarchy. Everybody looked at the French kings and went, why can't we be like that? They can do whatever they want. <laughs> the French did not have to ask the parliament for money to, you know, to, to levy, or did not have to ask them for taxes to raise money to do anything. They owned everything. The French kings had absolute power. While every other monarch that came along said, why can't we be like the French? At least in that regard. Uh, but not those heavy sauces. Uh, <laughs> so he wanted to be an absolute monarch, and he felt like the only way to do that was to have the support of a strong uh, episcopacy, strong bishops. In fact, James I was quoted as saying, without bishops there is no king. Again, no, no one was persecuted during this time, except the Anabaptists. And the Anabaptists always got persecuted. Feel bad for them. I mean, these, these are, I mean, Anabaptists are nice people. We're talking Mennonites and Hooterites here, you know. Um, so, even though only the Anabaptists were persecuted, James made no bones about the fact that he, he was concerned about Catholics, even though he, he were one. He was concerned about the Catholics because they had allegiance to the Pope. And he wanted everybody to have allegiance to him, not anybody else. He also had a problem with the Presbyterians because they had given him grief when he was in Scotland as, as the King of Scotland. But he was willing to let everybody except the Anabaptists go their own way with one exception. He absolutely insisted there had to be bishops because he thought that was, his, that was the thing that gave him the support he needed to be a monarch. <coughs> now, in 1604, and there were various people who were supporting him in that. Yes, Joanne? Anybody not have a problem with him being gay? Um, In that way. Yes, they did. In fact, that's one of the things they didn't like about him. Um, he, he was Scottish. He was Catholic. He was the son of Mary Tudor, who got beheaded for trying to you know, undermine the Queen of England. He um, was gay. They had a lot of problems with him. Okay? Um, he also was not liked because he... He had his favorites, and some of those favorites were his, you know, his partners, and others were just people he liked. And so he would give them lordships and lands and all kinds of stuff, and all of the real lords, the people who had a hereditary right to it, are saying, what right do these people have, other than the fact that you're sleeping with them? Him. <laughs> um, and he would do all that kind of stuff, so he was not popular with the other noble families because of doing that kind of stuff. He was not popular with the common people. Because he favored the air, even though they, they didn't like you know, some of what he did, he tended to favor the aristocracy because the aristocracy tended to support the episcopacy. And so pretty much everybody had some problem with James I. Okay? And no, his, his being gay was not popular. Okay? And the fact that he was a Catholic and gay, again, but he was king. You look past a lot of stuff when somebody was king, right? In 1604, um, one of the king's real supporters, Richard Bancroft was his name, who was Archbishop of Canterbury, introduced a series of laws that declared that the episcopacy, that is the right of the bishop, was divinely ordained, just like the divine right of kings. That, that people became bishops because God made them bishops, and therefore you couldn't challenge that. And he came out with other things that were other laws, canons, but they were laws that were the laws of the land, that were aimed against the Puritans. Again, the Puritans did not want to have bishops. That the Puritans were against having bishops or vestments or altars. They were against incense or gilded anything in the church. They were against doing anything on Sundays except um, worship or religious practices or charitable causes, but nothing frivolous. They were against anything they saw as licentious, which not only involved any immorality or showing ankles or things, but it included things like the theater, because they thought not only do they theater was fairly immoral back then. I mean, this is the whole Shakespearean kind of thing. But also, they thought there was something inherently dishonest about someone pretending to be somebody else, an actor. Okay? They had all kinds of problems. They wanted to purify the church and, in the process, the state. 
So uh, these kinds of things were pointed directly at them. Parliament was in session at the time these laws came out. It wasn't always. They got called into session. The king had the right to call Parliament into session and dissolve Parliament. The reason why Parliament was so important was the king could not levy taxes in England. That's what they liked about the French. The French king didn't have to ask. The English king could not levy taxes, no matter what the need was, unless Parliament did it. He had to ask Parliament to levy taxes. So you begin a process here whereby the king will call Parliament into session, ask them to levy taxes, and they'll go, well, okay, before we do that, we've got a bone to pick with you. And the king would go, forget it, go home, you're dissolved. And then he'd get desperate again, he'd call them back together and go, okay, we need this money. Well, before we do that, he'd go, no, 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 go home. All right, this happened over and over and over again. Um, it was not a very good system. So Parliament was in session when Bancroft came out with these new laws. James needed approval of new taxes, which is why he called the, the uh, government together. And the House of Commons, now there are two, you know, if you're American, we have two houses of Congress. We have, you know, the, the House of Representatives uh, and the Senate. His, that's based upon the, the European model. They have the House of Lords and the House of Commons. Even though nobody ever says this, we sort of saw the House of Representatives being kind of a House of Commons and Senate being higher powered and so the House of Lords. The House of Lords was nobility. You had to be a lord to be in that. But the House of Commons were elected from the common people. And it included bishops, who otherwise didn't have you know, noble blood or noble rights. So the House of Commons, who were having a problem with this, they were predominant or, or significant, at this point not predominantly, but they had a lot of Puritans in there. They appealed to the king against Bancroft's new laws that enforced the episcopacy and put down Puritans. Well, the, the king says, okay, let's have a conference about this. So they get together in a conference, and uh, while they're talking about it, one of the Puritan members of parliament, sort of as an offhand, he doesn't mean anything by this apparently, according to history, he mentions something about a presbytery. And the king, James, now a presbytery, by definition, is not a bishop-driven church. Those are two different models. You don't have bishops in a Presbyterian model church. It's run by elders, not bishops. So one of the members of parliament who was a Puritan mentioned a presbytery, and the king said there could be no closer connection between the monarchy and a presbytery than between God and the devil. What do you really think, James? <laughs> As a result of that, there was no conciliation, there was no agreement to soften or do away with those laws, um, and the gap widened even further between Parliament and the bishops, even though there were some bishops who set up Parliament. Then, in 1605, you have the famous gunpowder plot. Okay, so, so James is having a problem, James and his bishops are having a problem with Protestants. 1605, a short time after this, you have the gunpowder plot. The gunpowder plot was an attempt by a group of Catholics. They had actually purchased a building, or at least a building, I think, next door to the parliament, where the parliament met. And it had a basement that ran underneath the parliament building. Well, they packed this thing with gunpowder. The intention was, the Catholics, there had been a law that had just been passed right before this that actually suppressed Catholics' rights some. So it wasn't just the Protestants having trouble. The Catholics were wanting to blow up parliament, and in the process, kill the king, who they didn't like, and get rid of a lot of Puritans who were in Parliament. Well, they found out about it and they stopped it. This is the famous Guy Fawkes plot. Today in England they celebrate Guy Fawkes Day. He was not the leader of this, uh, of the gunpowder plot. He was only one of several. The reason he came to attention is because he had a military background with explosives and so he was the one in charge of the gunpowder. And so Guy Fawkes Day, they celebrate England with fireworks and all sorts of things. If you didn't know any better, you'd think Guy Fawkes was a hero. He's not. He's a bad guy you know, in European history, in the English history. But um, that happened. So now that now James is having trouble with Catholics, gunpowder plot, and with Protestants, with the idea that they're against the bishops. Then you begin in 1606 to have more anti-Puritan laws. By the way, I forgot to mention the only thing good came out of this conference that the king had with the Puritan Parliament was they agreed they needed a new translation of the Bible, which came out in 1611, and that is the King James Bible. Oh James the First. Okay. The f Enough said. King James Bible. You guys know about that. All right? Um, now, I'm going to have to move along here. Uh, I'm not going to get into the orthodoxy stuff today. 
Uh, James did not want to call Parliament again because they were giving him all this grief. They were Puritans and they didn't like him. They didn't like what he was doing. But he needed a tax uh, assessment. He needed for taxes to be levied. Particularly he needed it because this was at the start of the Thirty Years' War when his son-in-law, Frederick, the elector of the, pal uh, the uh, Palatate, had been deposed. James wanted to support him, the Palatinate rather, wanted to support him and get him back into his position as king now. And so he wanted to send an army. You don't send an army without money. Only the parliament can approve money. Okay. And by the way, you see some similarities? In the US government, the Congress can pass laws, the, you know, the balance of power. The president can veto them, but uh, the courts interpret the law as being constitutional, but the Congress has to approve the money. And so you have this balance of power. Well, that's the, what was designed here. But what they ended up with is this horrific political ping pong game for many years. Uh, so, in 1621, the Parliament is called again, and they discover when they get called that James is planning, it turns out unsuccessfully, to marry his son and heir to the Spanish Habsburg family. There they are again, those Catholic Spanish Habsburgs. So, the, the predominantly Protestant Parliament complains to the king and say, okay, we're not going to approve any money until you deal with this problem. And so James says, fine, go home. And he won't even talk about it. He dissolves the, the assembly. In 1624, that's not 16162, <laughs> those two zeros should be dash marks. Uh, I told you I had technical problems. Um, they try again with another parliament call, again a stalemate. The, the parliament will not approve money without dealing with some issues, and James is unwilling to deal with those issues. Then James dies. And his son, Charles I, becomes king. Charles I had not married into the Spanish Habsburg family, but almost as bad, he had married the sister of the Catholic French king, Louis XIII. So he married into a Catholic family. And when he, he becomes king, he allows his wife and her court to continue to have Catholic mass, which was considered heretical to the Protestants in England. And that issue of marrying a Catholic and having them practice Catholicism in London had been a problem before, and it's a problem now. So, then Richard Montague, who is um, a supporter of the king, he has written several books that both defend the divine right of kings and the divine right of bishops, and also specifically opposes Puritanism. The Parliament, mostly Puritans, has him arrested, <laughs> say, claiming that he is... He's opposing the, the goodwill of the people and the rights of the British government, which they think of as themselves being Puritans. Well, they arrest him, they try him, they find him guilty, they're going to imprison him, imprison him and find him. Well, because he's saying all the things that, that uh, Charles, who was, the, who was his father's son, who also wanted an absolute monarchy, he's saying all the things that the king wants him to say. So Charles steps in and makes Richard Montague his personal chaplain. As his chaplain, the parliament had no authority over him, so he didn't have to go to jail, he didn't have to pay a fee. And James is also parliament, or Charles, I mean, Charles is also parliament. Then, Charles keeps trying to call parliament to get funds. They won't give him the money he wants, they want to do other things. He dissolves them back and forth. He then names an anti Puritan named William Loud. As the Archbishop of Canterbury, actually he, he has him first, he later becomes Archbishop of Canterbury, he names him to head a commission, and the king pretty much takes all of the authority away from the Archbishop of Canterbury, the practical head of the, of the church. The, the nominal head of the church was king, uh, the Church of England, but the practical head is the Archbishop of Canterbury. So he takes all of the Archbishop's authority and gives it to a commission led by this guy, William Loud, whom nobody likes. Um, and and who is later executed, by the way. He continues to do things like award lordships to his supporters. In fact, talk about shooting yourself in the foot. Most of the House of Commons was against the king, but there were some people that supported him. And when somebody supported him, he rewarded them by giving them a lordship. Well, when he made them a lord, they couldn't be in the House of Commons anymore. They became, you know, they, they could only qualify for the House of Lords. And so he, ineffectively, was taking all of his supporters out of the House of Commons and making them even more against him. You know, uh, find something else. You know, God, buy a car, do something. But no. 
And so he is awarding lordships to his supporters in the House of Commons. He's making concessions to the aristocracy. Some of the concessions he's making to the aristocracy involve giving them more freedom to oppress poor people, making them wealthier on the backs of the poor. So the poor are getting, it's getting harder and harder and harder to be poor in England. And so the king, Charles, is losing, he's already lost the parliament support, he is losing some of the support of the, the nobility because he's giving lordships, or like his father had, willy-nilly, to his own detriment, and the poor people don't like him because it's getting harder and harder and harder for them because of his policies. Now, at this point, um, I got my stuff out of order. Okay. I'm going to have to work through this because I don't have this number right. In 1633, William Laud, who had been head of this commission, is made the Archbishop of Canterbury. And he starts very harsh measures against Puritans, both in England and he's given authority in Scotland. When I say harsh measures, he was issuing orders to, to the military to kill and mutilate people. Um, he tries in Scotland, the king gives him authority to do whatever he wants in Scotland. Loud goes up there and he tries to impose the English, that is the Church of England liturgy, on the Scottish. Now, they're Presbyterians. They're not Anglicans. They don't like this, and they rebel. The Church of England, or Scotland, excuse me, the Church of Scotland meets, and they vote to limit the power of bishops. When the word gets back through William Loud to the king, Charles, Charles dissolves the Church of England, the Church of Scotland. Says, you don't exist anymore. He was in a dissolving mood. You don't exist anymore, but they will go home. They continue to meet, they continue to make decisions, and they officially against the king and against William Loud, they declare the episcopacy, the bishops, are abolished in Scotland, and the Church of Scotland is a formally and technically to be Presbyterian. No more bishops. Okay. So, Charles sees this Scottish rebellion going on. Presbyterians. Charles sees this rebellion going on in, in Scotland, feels like he has to deal with it, and he thinks, this is a rebellion, surely the Parliament will help me with this. So he calls the Parliament, <laughs> asks them for funds to deal with this rebellion, and the Parliament says, you know, we agree with the Scots. They have a right to do whatever they want. They are becoming more Puritan like us, okay? And so at that point, it's like, this takes 10 minutes, and the king dismisses them again, dissolves it. That's called the Short Parliament, shortest whatever. That's the name in the history book, Short Parliament. You can look it up on Google. That Short Parliament and the reaction of the Parliament in favor of the Scots and against the King encouraged the Scots to invade England. So the Scottish come across the border, and at this time, the Scottish army was one of the most powerful in England. Well, Scots are crazy, you know. You saw Braveheart. Okay. Uh, yeah, go Scots. Okay. Um, Scottish, the Scottish invade England, and Charles the King sends troops to fight them. Well, he, he sends troops who immediately get defeated because they're not much. Charles, what does he do? He recalls Parliament. <laughs> He's thinking, now they have to help me because we have a foreign army invading England. Wait, foreign? <laughs> well, what's that? I'm sorry, his father was... His father was from Scotland, yeah, but still. Uh, <laughs> uh, so he says, they've got to support me now. We're being invaded. Parliament is really fed up with Charles. Uh, they're fed up with the fact that the whole country is in disarray. Nobody likes him. Nobody supports him. The poor are poorer. The rich are mad at him. And they're thinking, no wonder we're being invaded by the Scots, for heaven's sake. So Parliament, without asking Charles what he thinks, they repeal all the anti-Puritan laws. Any prisoners who have been imprisoned by William Laud and others, um, they release them. In fact, they pay them compensation when they release them from prison. They arrest and try some of the ministers of the king that they thought were guilty of these oppressions. And in 1641, they pass a law that says the king cannot dissolve parliament without their permission. <laughs> Let's stop this. The bishops are then physically by the local people of London. The bishops are kept from attending Parliament. Later on, they vote that no bishops can be a member of Parliament, so they get rid of the Episcopal influence there. 
Now, the king is in a mess. You know, he doesn't know what to do. He um, begins negotiating with the Scottish army, and several times he does this. He, he negotiates with multiple parties and promises them all the opposite things. For instance, he promises the Scots that if you'll stop invading my country and go back and even support me, I will let you have Presbyterianism in Scotland the way you want it. He also, at the same time, begins negotiating through his Catholic wife. Now, he's Catholic, but nominally, because he's the head of the Church of England, which is technically Protestant. Uh, his Catholic wife starts negotiating for him to, with the Catholic Irish, encouraging them to invade England in support of Charles. Now, negotiating with a foreign power to ask them to invade your country is not well thought of. Okay? Um, some of the Puritan members of Parliament, when this gets out, they want to try the Queen for treason against England. The King, as a result, says, you can't talk to my wife that way. And, and he says, you're guilty of treason for saying such things about the Queen. And so therefore, he demanded that Parliament turn those people that had, that had levied, uh, or had, offered the accusations against the queen, turned them over for trial, for treason. The parliament refuses. The next day, the king sends soldiers to arrest these guys. On the way, the people of London stop the soldiers, and a huge mob will not allow the soldiers to approach parliament. Okay? Um, so the whole city of London is now against the king. At that point, the king flees London. To, he's outside the king to some of his, uh, his palaces. And John Pym, who was just a member of Congress, or Congress, of Parliament, um, sort of takes over as the head of Parliament, kind of the first among equals, and they refer to him as the king without a crown. So Parliament is running the whole government now because the king is in absentia uh, for fear of his life. Parliament passes a law at this point to exclude all the bishops from Parliament, and they move, they start to make moves to exclude anyone who opposes Puritanism from um, speaking against them, being a member of uh, Parliament or anything else. So they're starting to get more and more radical about this, and they move to create a militia to enforce it, uh, their will against anybody who's anti-Puritan. Anytime you start forming a militia, them spiking words. So, the king responds by gathering his troops, and the Civil War begins. This is the English Civil War. Okay? Parliament took very specific steps at this point uh, toward Presbyterianism. They abolished the Episcopacy completely. See, slowly they had said, you know, um, you don't have any authority, then you can't be a member of Parliament. Now they get rid of bishops altogether. And they, um, partly because the bishops were supporting the king, and they call what's called the Westminster Assembly. One of the more important, in the history of Protestantism, one of the more important bodies. The Westminster Confession, which came out of the Westminster Assembly, is to one of the most important confessions of the Protestant faith. It's particularly Calvinist, but it's used by a lot of, a lot of them. In fact, the Shorter Catechism of the Westminster Confession of Faith is often quoted. If I ask you all, what is the chief end of man? What's the answer? To glorify God and enjoy Him forever. That's the Westminster Catechism from the Westminster Confession. What year was that? Uh, th this is uh, 1643, I think it is. Uh, right in there. Six, early 1640s. So the Westminster uh, Assembly meets. It involves 121 clergy people, a number of lay people, and seven leaders from the Scottish Church. As a result of them working together and coming up with this, this Calvinist Westminster Confession of Faith, that became a foundational reform doc, uh, Reformation document, or reform document for Calvinism. Then in 1644, England and Scotland joined together in their commitment to Presbyterianism through what was called the Solemn League and Covenant. The Westminster Assembly, commissioned by the Parliament, come up with the Westminster Confession, which is Calvinist, Presbyterian. The, the Scots are already there, so they join together, England and Scotland, and say, we are committed to being Presbyterian together. The very next year, William Lowe, the Archbishop of Canterbury, who had done all these horrible things, is arrested and executed for crimes against the nation. At this point, a man steps up named Oliver Cromwell. Cromwell was, he wasn't your average farmer. He, he was a landowner, but he actually was wealthy. He had been a former advisor to Henry VIII. He arises to power. He had had a conversion and was an avid Puritan. He really believed in the Puritan ideals. He also was a military man, and so when all of this started with the king, you know, having troops and all that, 
he goes back to his home and recruits a corps of cavalry. In the war between the king uh, and the parliament, the king's greatest strength was his cavalry because he was still supported by a lot of the nobility. The nobles were the ones with the horses. And so the king's great power militarily was his cavalry. The parliament, the common people, what did they have a lot of? People! <laughs> and so their strength was in their infantry. So you had two very different forces. Well, Cromwell, who was a wealthy man, you know, he was a he had properties and everything. He decided he needed to do something to balance that out. So he goes and recruits a corps of cavalry that ends up being a large body of cavalry. He comes back to uh, Parliament, and his his cavalrymen uh, they sang hymns when they went into battle. They had Bible studies when they weren't in battle. Cromwell was famous for saying, "May we have clean swords and dirty Bibles." Okay. He also said, because they had rudimentary firearms back then, uh, he said, trust in God and keep your powder dry. Okay? Cromwell was not an ambitious man per se. He often is painted that way, and he wasn't. He came back, and because his group that he led was so uh, spiritually oriented, so Christian and, and uh, disciplined, they inspired the whole army of the parliament. And they all started being like that. They would go into battle singing these hymns, and they absolutely cleaned the floor with the king's military over and over again. Okay? Ross? Yeah. What year was Cromwell? Uh, 1646, I think it was. 1645, 1645. Because 1646 they try to they try to get rid of him. Um, so the Puritan army under Cromwell crushes the king's forces ultimately at Naseby, the Battle of Naseby. And there, in the camp that's left behind, they find conclusive proof that Charles has been trying to get foreign Catholic invaders to enter England. They have documentation now. They found the papers in the camp. Uh, he's trying to get foreign forces that are Catholic to invade. At this point, Charles is trying to get out of all this. Since his army can't win, he's negotiating with the Scots to try to get them, you know, and he's promising everybody everything, whatever they want to hear. The Scots capture him. They turn him over to the English Parliament. So he's now a prisoner of the Parliament. Um, but at the same time, a conflict arises amongst the Puritans who were in, in charge of England between the independents, and they made up the majority of the army. They're the ones who didn't really want Presbyterianism. They wanted each church to be independent, run themselves. So the army was independent. The parliament was predominantly Presbyterian. They wanted to have a national church with elders running each church, okay? Well, they started having more conflict because the Parliament starts voting more and more and more toward Presbyterianism. Well, the independent Puritans in the army don't like this, and they start feeling more conflict. In uh, 1646, the Parliament tries unsuccessfully to dissolve the army because they see what's coming. Then the army begins to argue that they, who represent a much wider cross-section of the English people than Parliament, that they are the ones that represent the people, and therefore they're the ones who ought to have their say. At this point, King Charles escapes. <laughs> Who's in charge here? Let him get away. King Charles escapes. He again tries to negotiate with the Scots, with the army, and with the parliament, all at the same time, promising all of them something different, contrary things. He gains Scottish support by, again, promising Presbyterianism in Scotland. But the Puritan army... The Scots then invade again to support Charles, of all things. The Puritan army under Cromwell defeats them. They recapture the king, and they start a purge of parliament. The army now is in charge. The purge of parliament means they get rid of the ones who are adamantly Presbyterian, so that they've got more independent Puritans in the parliament. And that begins the rump parliament, as it's called, which is rump because most of them were gone. It was only a tiny rump of what they had before. The rough parliament, they, did, they vote to try Charles for treason. They do so. They find him guilty of treason against England. And on January 30th of 1649, they behead the king. Um, at this point, chaos threatens the lad. That should be land. <laughs> chaos threatens because the Irish rise in rebellion. The Catholics declare their support for Charles II, the son of the beheaded Charles I, um, and everything is breaking out in craziness. At this point, because nobody's in charge, Oliver Cromwell 
the head of the army steps forward and says, I will straighten this out. Again, not because he apparently had any, any desires for himself, because they offered him kingship later and he refused it. All right? He stamps out first the Irish Catholic Rebellion, then he deals with the Royalist outbreak in Scotland, then, because Parliament was the Rump Parliament was beginning to move to vote more powers for themselves, for instance, that they could never be challenged or questioned or dissolved or anything else, Cromwell did what the king hadn't been able to do. He marched in one day, ordered them all to get out of there, and he locked the door, and Parliament was done. But it was because, not because he wanted to be in charge, but because they were going in way in the wrong direction. They were making it worse instead of better. So, um, Okay. At that point, Cromwell sets out to uh, reform the church and the state, and he's very quite tolerant for religious differences. He allows people to practice their own religious beliefs up to the point where he feels like it's 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 challenging the civil authority or the you know the best interests of the country. Um, and he maintained that balance. He took the title Lord Protector. And he saw himself as sort of a regent without a king. He did not feel as though this was something that he ought to be doing forever. He tried to get parliamentary government back in place, and then kept messing it up. And he wouldn't take, he wouldn't stand for any nonsense. And so he continued as Lord Protector, but again, not to his own benefit. Um, he tried. He ruled throughout his own life, trying to get the parliamentary system back. Right before his death in 1658, he named his son Richard to be his successor as Lord Protector because he couldn't find another option. Well, Richard was not cut out for that, and shortly after his father's death, he resigned. He stepped down and said, this is not for me. Well, at that point, uh, after Cromwell, uh, who's in charge here? And the Parliament comes back together, and they feel they have no choice but recall Charles II as king. This is a people who knew nothing other than kings. You know, the reason that Cromwell had to take authority is because the idea of not having one person in charge, they didn't understand that. <clears throat> the Parliament had proven if there wasn't one person ultimately making the decisions, then they were going to mess it up. Parliament by now has recognized that, and with Cromwell gone, they recall Charles II as king. Charles reestablishes the Church of England and the Episcopacy in England, and he tried unsuccessfully to impose the Church of England again on the Scots. And the Scots won't have anything to do with it, okay? Then Charles dies. His brother and successor, James II, tries to restore Catholicism as the state religion. Well, they've had enough of this. After three years, the English rebel. They invite William of Orange and his wife Mary. Now, Mary was the daughter of uh, James. So she had a right claim to the throne. She's married to William of Orange, who was a prince in the Netherlands. Invite them to come over and rule in England. They do. James flees to France. Under William and Mary, tolerance is given to anyone who is willing to swear to the 39 articles that Elizabeth had created. These are the 39 articles of the Church of England. So they're going back to what Elizabeth had, where if you swear to these basic Protestant things, you can practice your faith whatever you want. And mostly that had to do with you know, we're going to practice it in a way that's fairly open-ended. Um, it was a very generous way to go. In fact, William and Mary, and you've heard of the College of William and Mary and all that. That's this, William and Mary. William and Mary said that you didn't have, even if you could not, in good conscience, swear to the 39 Articles, as long as you didn't present yourself as a challenge to the civil authorities, do what you want. True religious tolerance. Now, they encouraged everybody to swear to the 39 Articles, and most people didn't have a problem with that because during the whole reign of Elizabeth that had worked out really well. And under William and Mary, tolerance came to England. And the Church of England was established, became later as it spread around the world, the Anglican Communion. In case you wonder what Anglican and, and the Episcopal Church in America are, the Episcopal Church in the United States is one church that is part of the Anglican Communion, Anglican meaning Church of England. Okay. Um, here in Mexico, it is an Anglican church. In the United States, it's an Episcopal church. It's the same thing. It's just different manifestations. It's like, you know, like being a Christian Reformed church here in a Christian Reformed church in the United States. You're still part of a Christian Reformed church, even though you may use different names for it. Okay? 
questions about any of that? Yes? Is that William of Orange, is he the same one that was fighting in the Low Country? He's not. Now, he's from the Netherlands. I think that he's... he's I think that he's son. It's about the same time period. But actually, if you, I looked up this William of Orange, and it makes no reference to the fact that he was fighting against you know, the Holy Roman Emperor or any of that. But I don't have a good answer to that. Somebody asked, somebody mentioned that before, and I need to find out an answer. So I'll look that up for you. I don't think it is simply because a quick look at the biography of this William of Orange makes no reference to the fact that he was involved in fighting for Protestantism in, in continental Europe. Didn't you say that the other William of Orange was called like William the Silent or something? Well, those those were nicknames. Yeah, but I, I think that that's how you. I looked him up and confused. Oh, because yeah. <laughs> I was confused about that too. Yeah. Okay. So, so yeah, they are two different guys, but I can't remember. Dates yeah, I'll, I'll check the dates. I, I'm, I'm quite sure they're related to each other, but I'm not sure how. But I don't think it's the same person. Okay. Other questions? Yes, Chris. This isn't exactly about this, but you're looking at a couple hundred years of war that's very obviously political. It's very obvious, obviously religious. Today, when you witness the people, this often comes up. Like, look how horrible Christianity. It's, yes. you know, your response, of course, you look at it and say, well, you know, what's this got to do with Jesus and what Jesus said? But what do you tell people? Well, I'll tell you what, CS, what uh, G.K. Chesterton told people. Chesterton was good friends with H.G. Wells, as he was with Bernard, George Bernard Shaw, although Chesterton had nothing in common with Wells and Shaw. Okay? Chesterton was a Christian and a populist, and a, he loved beer and, and wine and uh, red meat and you know, uh, these guys were vegetarians and teetotalers and, and uh, you know, socialists and all that, and atheists. Well, after this, after being, but they were friends, which is great. After being in a lecture together, the story is told that they left the lecture and H.G. Wells and Chesterton are walking along, and Wells is just lambasting Chesterton over the violence and the bloodshed and the war and the terror that Christianity has caused on the human race down through the centuries. And he went, oh, he's just at him, you know, talent and tongue, and, you know, just going at it. And um, after, after being quiet for a long time, Wells takes a breath, and Chester says, well, Herbert, you do have a point. <laughs> we can't deny it. It's a fact. It is true. That doesn't make it right, and it also doesn't mean we paint Jesus with that black brush. Yeah. We we believe. Now I'm not going to get. I don't. I don't. Don't recommend that you get on your self-righteous high horse and go. Oh, those people. They were terrible. They were horrible. No, they were us. And in the same situation, I might have responded the same way because I'm a broken person. Okay. But the fact is that in our fallenness and our brokenness and our ignorance and our lack of wisdom. Humanity often does things, does the wrong thing, even though they're trying to do it for the right reason. And that's been the history of the church. You hear me pray before we start. Make us aware of all the awful things that's been done and be able to tell the difference between what is in your will and what isn't. Um, and that's it. I have to say, absolutely true. The church, now, the church is not the only one. Okay? It, it, the Christian church. The tendency in culture today is to say the Christian church, the Christian is the only one responsible for that. No. In fact, the Christian church in the world today is the most persecuted religious body on the planet. Okay? In more places, by more groups than any others. By Hindus, by Muslims, even by Buddhists in some places. Christians are killed, their churches are burned, you know, it's an on and on and on and on. Okay? And so it's not just us. It is a human fault. It is a human foible that even with the right reasons we do the wrong things. And I don't, I don't say that's okay, I don't excuse it. But I also say, don't paint Jesus with that brush. Just because we're messed up doesn't mean he's wrong. Okay? Yes? It's not an answer, to Chris, but I look at all of this from the time from Jesus to where we are now, and you can just see Satan through the whole oh, yeah. thing trying to destroy the church because God is associated with the church. Therefore, God is guilty by association. Yep. Yeah. And it's interesting, if you read the book of Acts, and we're studying the book of Acts, there's several, you can see the different ways that Satan tries to tear apart the early church. You know, first he tries to do it by outside persecution, you know, when the Jewish authorities try. Then he tries to do it by inside subversion, when Ananias and Sapphira, you know, there's a danger that they may have created a huge rift in the church by what they did. Then there's another attempt to split it sort of from the inside, 
when there's the question about how do we deal with Gentiles who become Christians, you know, and there were Jews who were saying they can't be they can't be Christians unless they get circumcised. Those conflicts, which in the early church, they did a really good job of dealing with. Mm -hmm. Every one of those, you can sort of see the hand of the devil, either from the outside or the inside or the sideways, but you know, somehow trying to tear things apart. Unfortunately, later on, we gave him a lot more success than he had during the time of the book of Acts. Yes, Ron? Just briefly, <coughs> saying is quite true that when you build a church, a Christian church, Satan builds around right beside it. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Yep, Satan's always there, right? In my experience, the people that, that are attacking the church for its violence and its history are also the same people who will scoff at you if you say Satan was at the base. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. And that's why, for somebody who's not a believer, I probably wouldn't use that answer because, well, it's true, because they would respond to that. You know, that gives them, you know, one more, one more, you know, cartridge in the gun. Yes. Well, I left, and I can't remember which missionary it was or what it was that was telling the story about. They had gone to a, an area, and it totally changed this very primitive tribe to where they were able to then meet other people. And and when the supposedly educated people arrived in that area. One person was talking to a tribe member and said, "Oh, you don't believe that stuff about God, you know, anymore." And the guy said, "Well, yes, we do. You know, he's totally changed us and all of our lives. Because if you would have arrived, you know, 30 years ago, uh, we would be eating you right now." Yeah. <laughs> so give thanks. Yeah. Um, and not and not that way. <laughs> yeah, you're exactly right. In fact, I was, I was saying you're thinking this. That while I would not argue, oh no, the church has a middle, oh no, you know, it's true, it's absolutely true, and let's just confess, let's admit it. Mm -hmm. But the other thing, along the line of what you're saying is, it's also true that the Christian church, down through the ages, invented hospitals, we invented orphanages, we invented public education, virtually any kind of charitable response outside our own group. I once said this, I once said that in a, a, in a classroom when the teacher, they invited me in to talk about a particular period of history, when I said that, the teacher said, what do you mean they invented it? public schools. And I said, they did. He said, the Jews had schools. I said, the Jews had schools for Jews. Christians were the first people who had universal access. It didn't matter in places where the first schools and hospitals and, you know, whatnot were set up. You could be, you didn't have to be Christian. You could be Christian or Muslim or Jewish or anything else. Still, if you had a need, they would be taken care of. And so, yes, the Christian church has had a very black side, but they've also had a very bright side. I mean, so, modern civilization is here because of Christianity. Yeah. Western civilization is based on Christianity. Yeah. Uh, maybe they talk about the Judeo-Christian ethic. Okay. We have to stop. Thank you all very much. And I will see you next week.